make sure we're, we're up and going here. I just want to do a little for you today. So. All right, y'all can hear? Yep. Okay. Yeah. And I'll have to put it back up for <laughs> All right. Well, welcome, guys. Thank you so much for coming tonight to uh, Brian Casey's talk on Ambulance Man. Um, my name is Emily Krafcheski, and I'm the site manager here at the Washington County Heritage Center. And uh, welcome to all of you on Zoom as well. I know we have some folks tuning in there. If you have questions, put them in the chat. I'll try to monitor that as best as I can. <laughs> um, we are open uh, pretty much every day. Uh, only day we're closed is Monday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. is our hours. Uh, so if you guys are interested in stopping by and checking out the exhibits, we would love, love, love to have you. A couple quick things before we take off. Um, that is the Zoom right there. I'm also going to dim the lights overhead so you don't have to squint as much. <laughs> um, restrooms are at the end of this hallway here. If you want to exit out the back and then go around, you're more than welcome to do that. And um, we do have several events coming up as well that you can check out on our website. So a little intro about Brian here, um, and I stole this from the website, so if there's anything wrong, it's not my fault. <laughs> um, Brian Casey is a writer, health educator, and public speaker. Brian was born in Mason City, Iowa, and grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota, Wauwatosa, did I say that right? <laughs> Wisconsin, and Stillwater, Minnesota, of course. Who here is from Stillwater, by the way? Most of you, excellent, I love it. <laughs> he earned a teaching degree from the University of Minnesota. Casey has spent his entire adult life working as an EMT, paramedic, EMS educator, and police officer. His latest book, Ambulance Man, highlights a uniquely intense and rewarding occupation, a story that has not widely been told. Ambulance Man is sometimes funny, sometimes frightening, but always heartfelt story of a young man's entry into ambulance work. And you can learn more about the book at alleylightpress.com or ambulancemanbook.com as well. We do have books for sale. And um, if you're really nice friend, he'll probably sign it for you. So if you're interested in buying a book, they are out in uh, the lobby there. And just uh, see me if you're interested in that. Without further ado, I introduce to you, Brian Casey. <laughs> So I really appreciate you folks coming out. That's really nice of you to uh, pay me that respect and show some interest in this project uh, that I have. So what I was thinking about doing is, um, is reading from the book and focus a little bit at the beginning on some Stillwater stuff because I think you'll find that entertaining and fun and familiar to some of you. And then, um, then I'll move through the book a little bit and talk a little bit more about the animals work here because you might have some curiosity about that. I hope you actually do. And, and the, in, the, in the introduction, she said it's, it's not a story widely told. And, and, and I know some of you folks in the audience are familiar with ambulance work, you've done ambulance work. I like that phrase, ambulance work. Um, and you probably do recognize that it's not a story as well told as uh, the fire service is told or uh, law enforcement. So I, it's a, a very unique career. And um, I'm very grateful that I was involved in it. And um, so we're on Greeley right now, and just down the block, 1504 Greeley. It's that it's, it would be the northwest corner. There's an apartment building there, and that's where the ambulance service was. Um, so I worked there through the 80s, and uh, eventually Lakeview Ambulance took it over. I worked at Lakeview for a little while. And prior to that, it was in the Bottlevix. If, does anyone remember the name Bottlevix? Yeah. So the Bottlevix had the ambulance service, and they were oh, what you might have called a Ma and Pa service. Uh, and that was on is that Pine or Olive? Olive across from um, our Savior's Park. Is it our Savior's Church? Thanks, Phil. Uh, no, that's how <laughs> I need this peripheral memory. Um, <laughs> And, uh, so, and, I, and I consulted the Bottlevix when I wrote the book, thinking they'd be very interested in it, but they weren't very interested in it, which was a surprise, because <laughs> I wanted to honor them for what they had done. But I guess I can honor them in the fact that they established a really caring ambulance service, um, and I benefited from that, even though I didn't work for the Bottlevix, but I kind of carried that, their, their history and their style continue so so let, what does that sound all right to you i'll just read a little bit How, can i ask who's read the book so people have, a couple of people have read the book and when i the reason i bring that up the thought of voluntarily reading out loud 
uh, I wouldn't have been able to do that many, many years ago. Because one of the themes in the book is not only ambulance work or growing up in Stillwater, but a learn an undiagnosed learning disability that I had that I just called a reading problem. And uh, I used to hide it. You know, I'm not embarrassed about it now. And it's, I've compensated so much, I don't even know if it is diagnosable anymore. I still uh, probably daily curse difficulty finding words to spell and such. Actually, word processing turned me into a genius. <laughs> um, a joke my wife and I had would be, um, I called her when I actually worked on the MOS because uh, I later had a career. Um, when I was at Stillwater, it was kind of like a part-time job and, you know, while I was in college. And then I went on to have a career as a paramedic. Um, I used to call my wife when I, because all the reports were handwritten, and I called her the grammar hotline. Uh, how do you spell tongue, for example? I don't even know how to, I know tongue starts with a T, and I think there's a G in there. Um, it's a stupid it's, word. <laughs> it is a dumb word. Um, and then, so I, I call her to ask how to spell, and then now, um, I'll just say the word on my phone, you know, how do you spell tongue? And then in the other room, I'll hear Terry start to spell it, thinking I'm right. <laughs> So let me start with that. How is the volume? Good, good. All right. I have a volume problem. I would like to read just the very beginning of the book. And um, I'll just get started. So at the beginning, there's kind of a, like a little poem that says, people say, I saw the sirens. You don't see sirens, you hear sirens. You see flashing lights. It's fundamental. Boyhood, first an inkling or a tinkling, like a little bell ringing, so slight a thing that I was unsure if it was something I felt or heard, like a premonition. I rested, I'd tilt my head and gently close my eyes. I would start by identifying the whale, police, fire, ambulance. I would have a fix on the direction and sometimes, sometimes minutes before others showed any notice. When other boys did finally notice, they might call out ridiculous with fire when it was obviously a police car siren. <laughs> a police car siren was electronic and the wail or intermittent matic two-tone sound moved quickly through town. By contrast, the fire trucks had wind-generated sirens and the gigantic sound pushed well ahead of the water-laden trucks. The turbine mechanism created a hum and burr that you could feel in your chest if you were within sight of the red fender trucks with flared fender fenders and men hanging on the side on the back. There were two Hearst-style Cadillac ambulances in town. One had an electronic siren, the other was wind generated. The ambulance drivers preferred the rig with the electronic siren. The sound of this one, the more modern of the two ambulances could be differentiated from a police car by the siren's slightly different tone. The older ambulance hummed and burred, but unlike a fire truck, there was no diesel engine sound between the wind up and the wind down. And the siren came from something that moved quickly like a police car. To track them, I created vectors in my head, maps based on perceived directions or distant glimpses. My library of knowledge included the most likely destinations and, and route probabilities based on the greatest driving efficiency. In pursuit, I sometimes relied only on the wake effect of the disrupted flow of traffic or a streak of spilled water at an intersection as evidence of a fire truck's passing. Never once did I ask another boy to point out the direction, but my technique included the sight of boys running. I looked for the subtle irregular activities of a pedestrian or a car's brake lights as a sign of an emergency vehicle's proximity. Few daytime emergencies occurred in Stillwater, Minnesota without my firsthand knowledge. So it gives a little insight into the kind of obsession I had. With that. <laughs> it seemed completely normal to me and fine, uh, and uh, I was fully invested in it. And just to say that few daytime emergencies that occurred uh, in Stillwater without my firsthand knowledge, I mean, I think that's probably the belief I had that it's a big, bigger town than one boy can run in, you know. <laughs> but I kept track of it all. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. 
I was attracted to the flashing lights and a rotating beacon up close could hypnotize me. The pursuit would excite me and the find would calm me. Ambulance chasing had brought grand distraction to my childhood boredom and anxiety. Others, people, other people's reactions to chaos was in, as intriguing to me as was a smoke-filled house or a car on the sidewalk next to an overturned big blue mailbox. Amateurs put their hands to their mouths and sighed or said things like, why is the ambulance taking so long? A crash scene was a form of art with all the elements of fluxus, a sudden disruption of order, a spectacular emergency response, and a lucky boy. The firemen wore unflattering costumes and most often could be seen doing some gross motor movement, a gross motor movement, like dragging a hose or carrying a ladder. The policemen stood around seemingly waiting for the excitement to be over or some other task could be, so some other task could begin, maybe paperwork. Some officers diverted traffic far from the front line. The mystery of the ambulance workers held my special reverence. They kept their duties hidden. Rarely could they be seen in action and they often came and went before I could arrive or they would disappear into a home and emerge following some unknown timetable. They drove the most graceful vehicles and the men always appeared lean and calm. Though I knew they dealt in speed and gore. When a fourth grade classmate boasted that her mother had taught her to say the Hail Mary in the wake of an ambulance passing, I thought this proof of their special status, their godliness. So that gives a little bit of insight into uh, uh, my method, uh, my interests, and my observations. Of course, you have some of your own, I'm sure, about things that you're interested in, but you're not, maybe not fully aware of what you're doing until you write a book about it or you feel like you feel compelled to um, share it with others. So of course, during these pursuits, it was all just my madness, my interest, my uh, desire to uh, for the excitement. And I do think I was a nervous kid. And, uh, and like a lot of kids, I was bored in the good old days when kids would get bored. <laughs> I'll just tell you a bored kid story. The other day, I looked, well, years ago, I looked out my front window and one of the neighbor kids was sitting across the street um, on an iron bar because there was a fencing there. And he was so bored, he was banging his stick on the iron bar. Like in a hypnotic state, and I thought that's the good old days, right? There. <laughs> you know, the kids were bored. And the next section I'm going to call is or read is called Earnest Me. This was my occupation, a child laborer, keeping a close watch in all forms of destruction. While other boys ranked their summer by good hits and camping trips, I satisfied my visual appetite on feasts of bent metal and blinking lights. The most glorious summer was the one in which a number of vehicles lost their brakes in our hilly town and either piled into buildings or parked cars or both. In one case, a runaway truck landed in the river. Best to be on scene as the excitement was still building. Otherwise, I'd have to settle for inspecting the damage and reconstructing, reconstructing the incident based on tire marks, degrees, and the statements of those who were there. I was a student of applied physics and the psychology of crowd behavior. Car wrecks, house fires, or an ambulance call to a neighbor's house was as unpredictable as a found coin. So between emergencies, I too built forts and threw baseballs. I was eager to be a boy like other boys and, and understood that uh, tailing emergency vehicles like an Indian scout was a, it had little utility, a sport of one. I would test my temperament in the athletic pursuits of my older brothers, baseball and wrestling. So um, I'm going to stop there because there's some baseball and wrestling stories that I think are very entertaining um, <laughs> that, I, that I'll let you if, you, if this retains your interest, you can read those on your own. But I'm going to skip ahead to say that uh, I developed a desire to work. I wanted to be a worker. So I knew that I needed to find something there where I could control the outcome. And it wouldn't be school or sports. I wanted to work. In fact, I uh, started a little company when I was, because uh, we were kids, you couldn't work 
until you were 16, even though you could have jobs at 14, 15 and such. I think I was, when I first really got turned on to the desire to work, um, I, uh, I was old, wasn't old enough to work at Holy Shad or something like that. So I uh, invented a company called Bride Will Do Anything. <laughs> and I have the flyer somewhere where I would, uh, I imagine doing deliveries or uh, it ended up just being yard work, which I did considerable amount of it. But. So next I'd like to talk a little bit about Hoolies. Anybody worked at Hoolies? There's a Facebook page called uh, I Worked at Hoolies. <laughs> So at least, um, I'll just give you a little history if you're interested. And it was, it was a grocery store that was down at the end of, is it Churchill by the river? It's one block north of, um, the Merch. okay. One block north of, um, uh, where the green cross of Chestnut, Chestnut, Chestnut. Chestnut, yeah. And um, Hoolies was a uh, Jack and, Charlie Hooley started the company from their dad. There's a picture in the museum on Main Street. And then, uh, and then eventually became Cub Foods, as you may know or may not know. So the Hooley brothers and a guy named Cub Davis uh, started Cub Foods. So many of us work in Cub Foods as well, but I was fortunate to work at Hooley's. And so it was a remarkable place down by the river. Um, the basement was always flooded. Can you imagine pallets of food right now on flooded floors? So I'm gonna go on to talk a little bit about who lives. Um, by age 16, I had graduated from the world of paper routes, grass cutting and leaf raking and snow shoveling to the world of real work at Hooley's grocery store. Being earnest and clever, I, I had kept my reading problem nearly undetected at school, but to my horror, nearly became my honeymoon in Hooley's. The first day Mr. Hooley assigned me to the task of organizing pallets of, pile, of file boxes chronologically. Fortunately, my brother, David, who's back there somewhere. <laughs> there David. Fortunately, my brother happened to be working nearby and wrote the months of the year on a scrap of cardboard for me to reference. I knew there were 12 months in a year, but I didn't know uh, what those months looked like and in what order they occurred. The second day was plagued by accidents. I go into some um, mishaps with Ms. Mr. Hooley uh, that are, I think are also quite entertaining, but I'm gonna skip ahead. Um, despite my troubled beginnings, it, it, uh, in time I was recognized as being conscientious, hardworking and powerfully disarming. I was promoted from maintenance man to carry out boy to finally the coveted position in the produce department. One day, a load of watermelons arrived from Texas on a semi with fenced sides. As the driver and, and as the driver's wife and three children waited in the cab, the one-eyed, dark-colored man threw down 400 watermelons one at a time. Each one hit me in the chest. They were so big and I so small but I had to try to catch each one in a cradled arms. Minus the broken ones, 400 times I staggered to the bin where I placed them. When finished, I exchanged kind nods with the wife and children as none of the group could speak English. I pantomimed to the driver that I would now write out the required invoice. We walked together through the produce aisle where I stopped at a display sign and I wrote the word watermelon on my hand. In the office, I leafed through other invoices until I found the word received. He watched me as I made out the invoice, 400 watermelon received. He paused before leaving, one kind eye, a smile and a pat on the shoulder. On the shoulder. Without words, he spoke with, and with the exchange, and the exchange with a man so foreign in this small town was well worth the pounding. I began to think of a larger world. I don't know if it came through there, but you know, I had to be very hyper vigilant about words. I knew I had to write a receipt. I had no, I didn't know how to spell watermelon. I think I probably could have come up with water. Uh, melon, who knows? Three, three L's, two L's, one L. I don't know. And um, and then received, I'm still not sure about that one. So I had all these little tricks that I would use to do that. And I did that all through college. 
um, you know, uh, had to have all these tricks to manage, you know, the world of words. So when I talk about a larger world, I think it's that experience that people have where they go, there's a bigger world out there and I want to go find it. Now, I wasn't, in my mind, that bigger world wasn't necessarily exterior, like across oceans, it was more interior into the kind of the places that Amos has went and uh, the sights and sounds of, that I imagine the public safety workers saw and did. And that's held my interest for 36 years. I'm a St. Paul police officer currently. Everybody thinks I look old and retired, but I'm not old. And I am older, but I'm not retired. <laughs> so for 36 years, I've done either uh, full-time, either ambulance work or police work. So still on our ambulance and taxi. Um, I think in, a, in the, the old taxi company used to be at the end of, at the bottom of the second street hill at Myrtle. Um, and then they used to have a tin roof. And though I was a very kind of a nice kid, we used to take pleasure in throwing rocks onto that tin <laughs> roof because the old cab drivers would come out. You can imagine these cab drivers, they're like lumberjacks. They could really curse the kids, you know, and they knew that's the best they could do was curse us. So that was uh, where they, the taxi was. When uh, um, the bottle VIX had it, it was just, uh, it was just an ambulance service. When Tom Croft, He's the man that I work for. He came to town. He um, bought the ammo service. And I suppose that I started in around 1980. And um, he also had a cab company as well. I walked in the door at Stillwater Ambulance and Taxi and told the two drivers that I had finished my 81 hour EMT course. And I wanted to work on the ambulance. Outside were the very ambulances that I had chased through the street chased through the streets and had longed to caress. The two EMTs turned their heads from the television and one said, cool, late, fine. <laughs> their boss, a man named Tom Kropp, had recently purchased Stillwater Amos. He had previously worked at Divine Redeemer Amos, serving towns south of St. Paul. A newcomer to town, Kropp had taken over the once proud Ma Pa service that had operated out of the Mason's home for a long, good long time. I did change names in the book, as you might know. I used the word Mason's instead of Bottlebricks, partly because they didn't show that much interest in it, though I don't, I don't despair, I'm not trying to disparage them. It's just, and Mason is the town I was born in, so I just chose that name, Mason City. Crop employed three full-time EMTs, each to cover a third of a month, working a 24-hour shift every third day. These men would each function as Crop's partner as they might split up or they might split up and call upon one of a group of part-time attendants to staff a second ambulance as needed. In addition to his upstairs apartment, the small house was also home to Crop's other teacher, <coughs> a taxi company. Stillwater Taxi had even, was even more sparsely staffed than the ambulance with Crop knowing that either could drive for the other in a pinch. When the Masons owned the ambulance service, it was probably just an ambulance service. The cab company operated under a, the cab company operated out of, I guess I already told some of these stories, but I'll continue. The cab company operated out of a shop located near downtown at the bottom of the second street hill at Mulberry Street. The building's large tin roof boom when we lobbed rocks onto it from the bluff above. We would only be satisfied if the cabbies came out and hollered vile words and threats. Now, I was to work with men. Hoolies had employed other boys or young men that my sister or brothers or I had gone to school with. But these cab drivers and ambulance attendants looked hard and angry and seemed to care little about where I had come from. I would report to work in my clean white dress shirt, onto which my mother had sewn a National Registry EMT patch. My very first assignment was a cab call. I had only ridden a taxi once before to the hospital to have my fingers stitched. Before paying the fare, my mother had to, and I sat patiently as the cab driver, a bit drunk, insisted, <laughs> insisted we listen to him sing a, Gael, a, a Celtic tune. <laughs> Surprised but unquestioned, I was off to drive a woman from her job at a nursing home to her home. 
and route the hood popped ajar each time I hit a bump in the road, erroneously believing that the hood would fly open at any moment. I would drive a block or two and get out and slam down the hood. I was so rattled that when we arrived at her home, I forgot to collect the fare and had to cover the charge with my own money. <laughs> with this, I was more than volunteering my time. I was paying to be in and around ambulances and eagerly trading time for opportunity. I wasn't able to make it very clear in the book, but I volunteered most of my time. Uh, I was there a lot before I ever received any money, and I was glad to do it. I, it was, I was just so eager to be in those ambulances or even around them. So next I'm gonna um, read something, it's called Ambulance Man, that subject, but I'm gonna stop short. Um, because the title of Ambulance Man is in that, in that section. I don't want to give it away, <laughs> all right? But I want to read the front end of that. <coughs> is this going all right so far? <laughs> My first emergency ambulance call was for an injury at a snow skiing area. I rode in the rear patient compartment as a third crew member, Crop, an off-duty off police officer, and me. I would remain unpaid until I sat in the front passenger seat or a, a, as one of the two attendants. I was calmed only slightly knowing that I was on board as an extra hand. The policeman didn't recognize me, but I recognized him. Years earlier, while delivering a newspaper to his house, I had peered in the ground level window investigating an odd splashing sound, not realizing, not realizing that people took baths during the middle of the day. I was repelled by the sight of him in the tub. <laughs> he yelled, get out of here, kid. Don't you know better than to go looking in other people's bathrooms? I did after that. <laughs> the, long drive drove, uh, the long drive allowed the ambulance to reach a comfortably high cruising speed. Being careful not to be noticed, I, I spied a look at the speedometer through the small sliding glass window that separated the patient compartment from the front seat. The needle approached 90. The ambulance rocked slightly and the sound of wind nearly overtook the siren. I looked out the side curtain the window, relishing the thought that I was traveling faster at that moment than I had ever traveled before. I go on to talk about um, what I revealed that gives you more insight in the title of the book, but I, uh, and the details of that first call, which I had a lot of surprising responsibility uh, taking care of the patient, but we mercifully arrived at the emergency room. And when I say mercifully, it was on my, mercifully for me, uh, there was no sense of accomplishment, just survival. A couple of clues in that section also too, is I'll just tell you that uh, this, so it was crop. And then the other attendant I, I referenced as an off duty police officer named Larry Doffenbach. Anyone recognize that name? <laughs> <laughs> so Larry Doffenbach made him became the chief of police. And so the first time I encountered Larry Doffenbach was in the bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> he also confronted me at Ben Franklin's one time and accused me of shoplifting. Um, can you imagine a town, how sweet a town would be that they would hire a police officer to work undercover at Ben Franklin's <laughs> watching the candy section? <laughs> So I would never think of stealing candy, and, uh, but he accused me anyway, and it was uh, it was my first bad police encounter, I guess. You're still mad about the bathtub. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so um, next, I'd like to read a, a thing called "The Minister Is Acting Strangely." So as much as this might be funny or entertaining, Amos' work is really sad work, and um, I don't mind that. Meaning, some work gets too painful and sad, and um, uh, and maybe some of you do work that's difficult in that well. You know, you have to care for others, or you do all kinds of social service work, or a teacher, or whatever. I get that. So I don't want to apologize for having sad stories in a book about anyone's work, but I do know that <clears throat> any group gathered have their pains and sufferings from their life experiences. <clears throat> I, um, I don't know if you view it this way, but telling these stories 
Now, many of them are 40, 50 years old, 40 years old. Um, so I don't feel like I'm violating any confidentiality. And I disguise certain stories in the book to, to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, but uh, there are sad stories in there. And um, I remember one of the first times I got motivated to write the book is I had told my wife's sister a story about an analyst call when I was in Spokane, Washington. And I watched her face as I told the story. It was a very sad story. It's in the book. And, uh, but it was very heartfelt. It was very soulful. And I thought, well, this is important stuff. These are important things to tell. So the reason I preface this one, the Mr. Acts actually strangely is, <clears throat> this is Reverend Carlson, though I changed his name in the book. Um, Bruce and Joe and I went to a grade school with, uh, we didn't go to grade school, but Ralph was our age. I guess we met up in high school. So Ralph was a kid our age and his dad, uh, this is a story about him dying while he was at church at, uh, what did you say? Our it's Saviors. It's Our Saviors. And it's a story in that, I did, when the book was published, uh, or before it was published, I sent Ralph, who lives in Minneapolis, uh, this section. I just said, I want, out of respect for your family, I want you to know I go into great detail about my experience with your, your dad. He had no idea that I had even been the, one of the analyst attendants when his dad died. So anyway, that's my way of prefacing it. <clears throat> the reason I really want, want to read this section of the story You notice I took the label off this bottle because I refused to not get paid for <laughs> is, uh, as you will see, it talks a little bit about what can happen to the mind under stress. <laughs> um, and it's all real and it all really happens, even though it doesn't sound believable. All right. <clears throat> about 90% of the book is exactly as it happens. 10% isn't uh, for a couple of reasons, including um, what's that deniability? Plausible. Yeah, plausible deniability. The Reverend Lindstrom, so I changed his name to Lindstrom, um, which almost was my last name because uh, my grand great grandfather was a blacksmith whose beard started on fire and he died. And, he, and the Lindstrom married our great grandmother, and then uh, my, my brothers are like, I hadn't heard this story. Um, <laughs> and then um, and raised my grandfather, his brother. <clears throat> but my grandfather kept his name Casey. The night Reverend Lindstrom collapsed, the caller only stated, The minister is acting strangely. Witnessing a sudden sensation of speech, bewildered expression, clutching of the chest, and falling face forth first to the floor was in fact strange behavior. He may have had a hypo hypoxic seizure while turning an ashen color. It would become increasingly clear that one should hold loosely the stated nature of a call. I had reported for duty in the diffuse light of late afternoon. Emerging from the animal's quarters, I was disappointed to find that it was now dark out. I had thought that the warm sunlight would keep me from shivering. I felt weak and cold, although not from the cold. I was still working as an extra person and rode in the calls seated in the patient compartment of the ambulance. As the rig exited the garage, a familiar shudder started at my upper arms and spasmatically, spasmatically drew my elbows into my sides. A wave of trepidation traveled down through my gut and into my legs. My inner thigh muscles would contract and cause my knees to knock, and my clenched teeth caused my jaw muscles to ache. I endured the same flush of anxiety during each ride to an emergency call, but I knew that once out of the ambulance and moving, I'd be able to function. I didn't understand at the time that this adverse reaction is neurologic, a chemical uh, or chemical and not character. Uh, my adrenal glands hijacking my body for fight or flight. Instead, I assumed it was a mental defect, another deficit to hide and endure. At the time, I did not imagine a future self free of this discomfort, but I did not understand that my future self was being formed.
but I did understand that my future self was being formed, formed by a fire of sorts, a fire that had that hardened steel. I was hoping for nerves of steel. As we arrived at Ascension Lutheran Church and entered the building, people uh, moved about as if lost in the very church they had been baptized or married in. Some clawed their ways to the exit and others staggered about as if the minister himself had exploded and they had been struck by human debris. We have moved against, we moved against this stream. The Reverend was lying on the floor of the chapel. Having moved too quickly, I arrived at his side before the rest of the crew. Before me was not only a dead man awaiting resuscitation, but someone I recognized. I, met him, I had met him months earlier at my high school graduation. He was the father of a classmate. Standing near his head, I became enveloped in a void-like uh, silence as I fell into a sudden trance. I was without a filter to protect myself from taking in the full reality, and I lacked the experience to see it from other than a civilian or pedestrian perspective. A circular haze around the small scene, a circular haze surrounded the small scene, as if I was looking down a tunnel. I could see only my, his deep blue-gray head surrounded by shoes. Um, I even recognized my own uniformed boots. Prop barked out an order, and suddenly I was an ambulance attendant again, in charge of the mechanical ventilation with an oxygen-powered resuscitator. I became an, a completely absorbed in the task of ventilating him once every five seconds. Uh, my concentration was absolute, like a deep form of meditation. I was engaged in a supreme focus on rhythmic breathing, except I was doing the breathing for another. The force of, the force of this single-mindedness was so great that we arrived at the hospital without my recognizing the trip. In the hyper-illuminated emergency room, his treatment turned into a mechanical exercise of electric shocks and drug administrations. It felt good to be out of the reach of the congregation. The doctor instruct, instructed me to take over chest compressions and I applied the same intense focus to the compressions as I, as I had to the ventilations. I reasoned that a single lapse in rate or depth would throw away, throw away a handful of the man's brain cells. So to precisely time the sequence, I attempted to, attempted to use a clock on the wall before me but the clock's hands, as if personified in waiting for me to look, suddenly, suddenly spun cartoonishly clockwise, then counterclockwise. I was quieted by a nurse quizzical look when I regrettably commented on it. Fortunately, my crazy talk was lost amongst the mix of chatter and organized chaos. A final electric shock turned, returned to heartbeat, and soon after he was reanimated. He began to thrash about on the narrow gurney and vomited more than I knew possible. Each time he did so, the vomitus came out with a gigantic roar. It was as, it was as if white smock villagers had captured a wild beast and were trying to hold it on a table. Despite its large size, fierce sound, and spewing of vomit, they were, they were able to keep the creature from escaping. He became manageable again only with the loss of his pulse. Prop tapped me on the shoulders and said, simply, let's go. I walked out knowing that I had now had a cardiac arrest, the crown jewel of ambulance work in my small but precious cachet. The rush of adrenaline that had made me nearly convulse, the altered time perception, the crazy spinning clock hands were all part of the wild ride my body had taken me on. The clock had acted like a clock, I had been the one with internal spinning parts. I kept the experience of the ring of shoes around the minister's blue face and the cartoon clock a secret, a touch of shame and a touch of miracle. I had decided years earlier to keep my collection of these things to myself. The call had taught me numerous things. And for the next cardiac arrest, I would be more adept with the essential tools of the trade. Though the lingering smells, sights, sounds were close at hand, what was most present in my mind was not the victim himself, but the memory of the atmosphere of crisis and death 
and other people's reactions to it. Most importantly, my knees had knocked, but I had not fallen down. I had tunnel vision, but I saw my way through it. There were gaps and crooked lines in my memory, and the things that had happened I could not explain, but no one else had seen me falter. No one knew what was going on inside me. With no thought of an alternative, I would continue as I would continue as I always had. So do you believe that story that I had? That, uh, maybe some of you have had the same experiences. And the reason I say that is one of our brothers is an attorney and he was at a, a high level meeting, maybe that had to do with million dollar transfers of money and it wasn't going well. And he said he found himself floating above the room looking down on himself. So. Um, I'm very familiar with this now, so I'm a St. Paul police sergeant, and my job is to attend to the officers' health and well, mental health and well-being, and that's what I do for a living. So I meet with officers after they've been involved in critical incidents, particularly officer-involved shootings or other horrific events, and I recognize that sometimes they disassociate. Maybe some of you are familiar with that word. Um, you know, children that are abused, for example, disassociate because they can't physically lead, so they mentally lead. I think that's what happened to me in some of these situations. It was just overwhelming. And, uh, and I, it's hard, you know, I know some of the other people, um, like Dave and Jerry have, have done public safety work. You know, I, I find it hard to believe that most public safety workers didn't have a period when they started out that they thought something was wrong with them because it was overwhelming, you know, the sights and sounds. Matter of fact, I have more respect for those that find that exceptionally challenging than persevere, you know. So that's, a, I think, a super interesting story. So let's see here. I can tell this is going a little slower than I thought. Okay. Uh, I just didn't, so I want to thank you. So I just want to maybe skip ahead a little bit to some more get out of the still water thing, okay? Um, this next one is titled, um, Brian, it's the ambulance. It's just kind of a tribute to my folks because what the ambulance service did is that they um, would pick me up at my house. And that's the way you, so if they, you needed an extra crew or, or they needed two ambulances in service, they'd just simply call you on the phone and say, we're coming to get you. And uh, sometimes I would hear the phone, my folks would have to wake me. And of course, true to my nature, I sprung out of bed half dressed and, and would go out and wait for the ambulance. And um, that was a kind of a magical experience waiting for the ambulance. And it would come silently because they wouldn't want to advertise that they were, you know, driving the wrong direction to pick up another crew member. And I remember one time waiting for the ambulance to arrive and thinking, did they forget me? And then I realized, you know, me and some other poor bastard are waiting for the same animals. <laughs> um, uh, so, so I'm going to skip that story. Just uh, you have to read that next. Um, the next is what I call a God-fearing man. And these are just some stories I picked out. And the reason I like the, the God-fearing man one is um, um, that old phrase. Uh, wisdom is when you... What is the phrase, uh, to know wisdom is to fear God? Uh, it's an old phrase um, that I ascribe to. And um, uh, it talks a little about some of the characters of Stillwater, or this name of them, and I won't go into them because I'm not going to have the time. Uh, Limping Lena, some of you, uh, Buster, okay. um, who have I forgotten? There was a rubbery faced man that I used to. Uh, don't know if I if I was the only one that saw him. Uh, he'd drive around in these like homemade vehicles. And there was another man uh, that my brother Mark will appreciate, um, a Native American man that was the groundskeeper at Pioneer Park. Can you imagine having a groundskeeper at Pioneer Park? It's a beautiful thing, you know. And uh, he, I wrote in the book that he, uh, with black paint and futility, painted no dogs on the cut stone walls, because he probably was tired of picking up after dogs. But he, I, he looked like a man that could have been from the original Native Americans in the valley. I mean, he was, he had a, a, a long horse face, 
uh, predominant long, uh, long beak-like nose, dark olive skin, and long black hair. And I remember thinking, we really feared him because we didn't know him. Uh, and in the book, I say, because no one had ever talked to him, Mark says that he did talk to him one time. Another guy that we really feared was Buster. And Buster, we thought, was a punch drunk boxer. That was the narrative that we told. Because uh, he would run around town in these rags, throwing punches. And we yelled, hey, Buster, he would punch a street sign for our benefit. <laughs> I ran into Buster one time when I was carrying groceries at Hooli's. And um, he looked me in the face and got real close. And I could s smell his breath and his sour body odor. And his eyes must not have worked right, as if he was looking through a prism. Because I remember he kept tilting his head, trying to get me in view. And he finally growled, you look like the crusher. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember thinking, wow, I've never been likened to someone big and tough like that. I'll take it. But I was thinking, please don't eat me or the grocery <laughs> And then uh, another time I was on a bicycle ride out by Lake McKissick, and I came upon Buster. He had pulled, it, pulled his, his junker car off into the weeds, and he was pounding out some scrap metal from some scrap. And he had, was sitting on a stump and he had loosened his pants to sit more comfortably because um, maybe he had a big gut. And I remember we startled each other. And I remember thinking, don't make any sudden moves. <laughs> but don't look too afraid at the same time. Jerry and I are both police officers and uh, we know that world where you ever get just to watch each other's bodies very closely as deciding how you're going to engage or not. And, um, and I remember thinking, you know, is that stone in his hand a primitive tool or is he going to strike me with it? And we exchanged some just simple pleasantries and I wrote off quickly. <laughs> so I may have forget, forgotten some of the old people of Stillwater, but if, you, if the book holds your interest, there's a line in there about how, and this may be like other towns, others have grown up as well. The estranged people were not were kind of protected in the town. So people had these appearances that weren't a big deal and uh, people watched out for those folks. There is a funny story about Libby Lena in the book um, where she was someone, uh, friends of my folks had seen um, her carrying a mattress along Highway 95 because of supposedly she lived out by Dutch town towards the boom site. And they kindly pulled over, you know, can I give you a ride? And she just cursed them out. <laughs> so I won't go into that story other than um, there's a story at the end where I was driving a cab to go pick up an intoxicated fellow across the river. I'll just finish with that part. Um, so I had, sometimes when there was no cab driver around, you'd have to take the cab call. And uh, it wasn't uncommon to have to cross the river to go to the bars and retrieve some intoxicated fellow bring them home. Um, and I'll just finish with that. I'll just tell that section because it's kind of funny or interesting. There was another man, and it also speaks a little bit to my naivete and innocence. Uh, and I think that's one of my motivators to get into ambulance work because I was, had this na naiveness that I wanted to somehow get over, but maybe I overdid it a little bit by going into public safety for 36 years. <laughs> um, it's all good. There was another man who, as the story went, had lost his entire family in a house fire. The kind version was that the house fire had made him a drunk. The unkind version was that his drunkenness had caused the fire. I first met him in, uh, in person after bar closing on a cab call. I picked him up outside the Buckhorn Bar and helped him into the back seat. Um, I knew where he lived without asking. I drove down the long incline and crossed the lift bridge into downtown through the empty night streets and up the North Hill towards his house. He reclined in the back seat cursing, Jesus Christ this and God damn that. These are not phrases I use other than literally in literature. I winced and hunched my shoulders each time as if, as if he was showering my back and neck with the back of my neck with spit. I finally called out after over my shoulder, 
Could you stop using God's name like that? I was unaccustomed to foul language and increasingly unsure where God started and I ended. I felt responsible for his good name. My request seemed to strike him sober. He sat up and stared at me in the rearview mirror. And then leaning forward at the side of my head, he whispered first and then shouted, you're a God-fearing man. You're a God-fearing man. <laughs> that was pretty bold of me to confront this guy in the back seat. Uh, next, there's another story called um, Blinding Light. And I think I'll just tell you, tell you some of these stories and then move on to some of the Stillwater stuff. The Blinding Light was, Crop uh, was a really mean man. Um, and and he probably, he's dead now. Uh, and I didn't kill him. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I won't say any more about that. But he, uh, he was mean and difficult, really a difficult person. There was no softness or helping or whatever. Um, me learning that skill. And I remember thinking that if my dad or my brothers knew how he treated me, how abusive he was, um, they would have intervened and then I would have forever been a boy. Uh, so I'm glad I toughed it out. It was, it's, it's not a big deal. I mean, life is tough and people can be mean and you, you can do just fine with that. But at the time it was pretty rough. And I tried to navigate his insanity. And the blinding light was an ambulance call out towards DeMontreville for a baby not breathing. And uh, in ambulance work, those calls frequently are febrile seizure and everything's fine. But sometimes they're dead babies. And this one turned out to be a baby that had died. Uh, but in route to that call uh, at night, um, he didn't know where they didn't know the location. It was out towards a new housing development out by uh, the Montreville. And so I had to look it up on the map in route, which is the way we did that. And it was high speed, uh, what is it called? Uh, not mountaineering, um, navigating kind of high speed. Like you're going to a call in a rocking, blinking ambulance, and you're trying to look something up and read the small print and figure it out, knowing that lives literally depend on your speed and time and efficiency. And he cursed me vilely for turning on the light. I remember thinking, but I can't read in the dark, you know? So I had to really collect myself knowing that I shouldn't let my, any abuse cascade into dysfunction, because I knew when I arrived at this house, I'd have to go to work, which we did on this, this little baby. But it was um, just that story, and then that transitions to um, a story that I just want to read for you, too, that's in the middle of this, because uh, it's pretty dramatic. And I'm sure you like some dramatic stories. The work, so while we're en route to this, I, or while I describe en route to this call for the baby not breathing call, I, I insert a small story here about something that happened. The week earlier, I had responded to a call for a toddler that had been found floating in the backyard pond. With the report that the child was blue and the great distance to the rural address, I thought we were too far away to change the outcome. I was working with Greg Condon, a large man with hunched forward, hunched forward posture. His red curly hair had come, came, came down in bangs on his forehead. Ambulance work was just a temporary stopping point on his route to becoming a police officer. The first few months uh, I was on the job, he made clear his dislike for me. Once while I was admiring his truck, he approached me and announced that if I ever saw that if I if he ever saw me touch his truck again, that he would knock me on my ass. I stared at him and I waited for the others nearby to quiet their guffaws and I said, well, you might as well knock me in and my ass here and now because I just decided something. After extending the dramatic pause, I continued, not only am I gonna to touch your truck again, but I'm gonna piss on it every time I feel the urge. <laughs> Condon and the others didn't react because that response only was a fantasy in my head, in my head for days later. So that would have been completely out of character for me to do that, um, but not to think it later, like a good uh, Minnesotan. In reality, I had done worse than say nothing. I had, I had apologized and stopped short of using my shirt sleeve to wipe out a smudge that I may or may not have made. 
Apparently, he believed I was taking available overtime pay opportunities he felt uh, could, should go to him. However, eventually, he, his view of me softened as he could see I was not hungry for money, but instead I wanted more than anything to, to be good at the work. Uh, where greed or selfishness provides a handle for which your enemies can grab, our earnestness was disarming. Add being uh, uh, hospitable with a growing competence, I was left. I was left with quiet strength. The same narrow eyes that he had threatened me with were focused on the road in front of us. A curve could be uh, made straight by entering it a half lane wide and then driving towards the apex and accelerating out. The brake used to scrub off just enough speed to keep us on the road. He bent forward. He appeared to be steer with his arms. He's, he appeared to steer with his arms and chest rather than his hands. His often disheveled appearance be, uh, betrayed his, uh, his, his perfectionistic desire for speed and efficiency. He cursed himself for the seemed to be the slightest lapse in uh, perfect driving technique. You can see my reading skills aren't that good, and I'm worn out already from <laughs> that. So. Uh, I have to, Joe, would you come up with them? <laughs> <laughs> Minutes into the drive, we were told that the child had been placed in a squad car and was now headed our way. The weight had apparently become unbearable for them. A good distance ahead on a long straightaway, I saw the flashing lights of the deputy squad car. Our combined speed closed the distance at nearly 200 miles an hour, but the narrow gap was suddenly pierced by a freight train. Outside the ambulance, I crouched down to look under the speeding train. I could see the squad car parked at an angle in the uniform shoes of the deputy and the bare feet of the father pacing back and forth as the freight train rhythmically clicked by. As the caboose passed, pulling with it a gust of wind and debris, followed by a diminishing clicks, I heard the child's full breath wail. The father was unwilling to release the child and we placed them together on the stretcher in the ambulance. The child had been saved by his father's mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation that he had been taught the week earlier at his job at the post office. I yelled to him over the child's vigorous crying that the son would be all right. With this, the man began to weep as the child tried to escape his grip. So then I go on to talk about the route to Montreville, and then later that night, Remember, this is where a crowd really bitched me out and super hostile and whatever. Uh, and then later at night, we went on another call where um, the car was in the ditch. And I ran down to the car and the crowd yelled, uh, power lines, power lines. And it stopped me in my tracks. And I put my hands out as if he had yelled snake. But there were no power lines. He just saw me running towards the car wreck without thinking. So as, as, as rough and abusive and tough as these men were, they knew what they were doing. And they wanted me to get this up to speed immediately. You know, can you imagine if I would have stopped doing the work because I got my feelings hurt or they were treating me super nice or, or even if I would have been, you know, felt like I wasn't cut out for the work because I got nervous, that type of thing. So then I go on to talk some other stories I could see I'm already at eight o'clock, so let me just find a Spokane story. So what I did then is um, uh, worked while I was in college uh, as for Stillwater Animals, which included working at the Apple River in the summer, which is some funny stories there. Um, uh, going to the state prison on calls, uh, which I which I thought was fascinating until one of our coworkers said, "Casey, we trade you for a Hershey bar." <laughs> uh, um, and then, uh, there's also the story of the Brian's fire, uh, which I was on that call where two modern Levi firefighters died. And the lead up to that story would be a good reading because it talks about our trip, how our little routine of how we moved about the town as, as boys um, and would end up at Brian's to buy beef jerky. And Mark Bonos has called that section called beef jerky in a marble. Right. Uh, which Mark one time was must have been negotiating with my folks to get some other gift and said, just for Christmas, we'll be happy with some beef jerky and a marble. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So I'll skip that story. Let me just do, um, I don't know what to do here. So before I would have gone into Spokane, I'll just tell you what happened. So I, um, I became very competent as an EMT because I was very earnest and very studious and studied. I would take my grandmother on drives um, and study maps and make maps of towns. I literally would drive to Somerset because I didn't have a map and create my own map and, um, and practice how to get to the hospital. I mean, I couldn't have been more earnest. Uh, and it was mostly because I, that's just the way I was designed, I guess. I didn't want to screw up and understood my responsibilities. Then I graduated from college. Uh, right out of college, I immediately went into paramedic school. College was so arduous for me. It took me five years, had to pay my own way. And it was very, a huge, massive struggle. You know, and I did very well in college. And then I was so brain weary at the end of college. I saw a guy mopping the floor one time. I thought, man, that's a good job. <laughs> <laughs> I like to mop the floor. Um, and instead I thought I'll go to paramedic school because I want to do labor. And then I went right into paramedic school. And then I got married, Karen and I got married right out of there and she went to graduate school in Spokane. So I got a job as an uh, animal service in Spokane. And then um, the Spokane, uh, I was there for two years and then I'll just leave it there because that's where the book ends. But I do have hinted that I had a, a different career beyond that. So Spokane was a private animal service. Um, I talked a little bit about in that section what I call the anatomy of an animal's call. Just tell you what, how animal workers think and behave on an animal's call, uh, what their priorities are. There's this one section that I just want to read to you real quick. Um, about the call description. The call description could be vague or specific. So when I say a call description, if you're an ambulance worker, they call you on the phone back then or call you on the radio, and say your number, and then tell you what you're going to. Makes sense, right? Um, the call description could be vague or specific. And I give you a list here. Weakness, <laughs> stroke, seizure, overdose, difficulty breathing, no breathing, chest pain, chest tightness, chest discomfort, someone doing chest compressions, abdominal pain, labor pain, any variety of pain, strains, or, or sprains, fractures, falls, crashes, or the rare shooting or stabbing, uh, vomiting, bloody nose, bloody stool, high temperature, low temperature, can't walk, can't stand, can't sleep, can't be woken up, can't stop thinking about killing himself. So those are a variety of things that animal workers do. If you say to yourself, oh my God, I'd hate to go to those type of things, then you're probably not cut out for an animal service. Because most of us be like, all right, let's go to work. <laughs> um, even as a police officer, Jerry and I, Jerry was a Minneapolis cop and I'm a St. Paul cop. Um, you know, we'd get calls where it'd say, the boyfriend won't leave the house and he says he'll fight with the police. Now, my brother John in the back is a longtime police officer as well. And um, our reactions back then were like, oh, this is good. Let's see how this goes for this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in animals work, it's similar in the sense that um, you, um, there's, a, there's a section I call that good is bad or bad is good. We like bad things. And the bad, worse off you are, the more excited we are. <laughs> work. And I remember one time on a call where a woman, this man had, very badly injured, and a woman had this lilting voice um, that said, um, oh my, she said. And I was thinking, that's not the, what you want to hear from an ambulance worker, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I know I've been kind of gender specific here with uh, ambulance man, because the career was largely men, but I work with a lot of women in ambulance work, and a lot of women in police work now, thankfully. So. There's another section I'm just going to quick just go through a couple more. Night into day, day into night. In Spokane, I work 24 hour shifts. I think you find that an interesting section too, because you saw the full arc of the day. You work 24 hours on an animals. You have time to sleep sometimes and all that, but you get just to see the rhythm of a city and the kind of change of shifts. It's fascinating. Uh, bad is good was a section where we talk about what I talk about, like I said. And then, um, there's a thing I call comfort of light. And that's a Spokane story where um, I 
think I started to show a few fractures, if that's the right word, you know, so I started to suffer a little bit um, from the work. Uh, and then uh, there's another thing called um, behind closed doors. And that's a story that, uh, uh, let's see, what would you rather do, ask questions or should I read the behind closed doors? We have time for both, it's okay. Do I have that? We have time for both. Okay, I'll do the behind closed doors and that's the last one I picked up. Now, Terry said, don't pick out something good for the end. I don't know if this is good for the end. It's a little bit sad, it's a little bit, um, I like sad stories actually, um, I collect them. Um, but it gives you some insight into the work in people's lives. I don't know of any business, I don't know of any occupation that go to sees how people really live more than animals work. Now, police work is pretty close. And you go to, into people's homes and really see how they live because they, they're not prepared for you. It's an emergency. Um, I love that. I've got an indoor job now, but that's what I miss most about police work. And my brother John would say the same. It's just not going into these people's lives and just seeing how they live. Sometimes you solve their problems, sometimes you don't. Fascinating work. So behind closed doors, so you might, <laughs> this is a great way to start, start a story. I hope you're not offended. <laughs> <laughs> I've held back. No occupation goes into more homes and sees more people unprepared for visitors in animals work, both the rich and the poor, but mostly the poor. The poor use animals as like taxis and emergency rooms like clinics, minus the appointments. The dwellings of, of the needy can look unremarkable on the exterior and hold inside all levels of despair, disorder, and dysfunction. A frequent sight was a poster showing footprints in the sand and the Lord's reply that he carried them during times of trial and suffering. Also, also remarkably common was the vast number of adult men living with their mothers. We arrived at a house in a tough neighborhood where a half dozen or more cats moved about. Initially, I incorrectly assumed that the pale and oily faced man in the gray t-shirt was the patient. Instead, he was one of two brothers. He eagerly showed, me, showed us his police scanner. His admiration was obvious, and I felt as if I was being treated like royalty visiting the humble home of a peasant. An amiable old woman told us we were called to attend to her other son. We found him sitting on the edge of a bed wearing what appeared to be one of his mother's nightgowns. Feminine napkins littered the floor. In this cluttered and dank smelling house, the only thing I knew, uh, knew was not it. The only thing I knew was not in the house was a female human of childbearing age. He was suffering some malaise that left him unable to do his paper out. What I didn't know didn't bother me. And what I did know was that he was beyond an easy diagnosis, but unlikely, unlikely to die within the day. So we'd simply give him a ride to the hospital. Without an illusion of something more than a cab ride, cab ride my decisiveness and confidence apparently gave Ernie, who was my partner, the impression I understood more than I did. And as we left the ER, he asked, what was his deal? And what was with all the tampons? I said, I don't know, an infection maybe? I thought it was not, there was not a lot of meaning to be had. It was just disorder, entropy. Someone in the house maybe thought they were a girl. A paper route was someone's highest achievement. This was how many people live. We just got to see it. And if there is a sense to, if there's sense to be made, that sense probably wasn't when it makes sense to our well-fed, well-loved, advantaged lives. To Ernie, I had apparently acted as if I knew, but I had just acted more confident in my unknowing. I'm troubled by the troubling. This was not to say that it was, it went unnoticed. These events felt soulful to me believing that the greater sin was to not know they existed, being ignorant to how people live. God bless Amos work.
like, wow, was I lucky to be able to do this work and see the sights and sounds. We have time for go? a good. We have time for a, a couple questions if anyone has them. Can you said that you rode in the back? you know, as a volunteer stage type of thing after they paid. How did that work then as far as being a paid employee? So then eventually, up? so eventually they said, um, so I was already an EMT, I'd done this at Tisco, so I had the certification, mm -hmm. but they just wanted me to get more experience. Mm -hmm. So then eventually, and it probably was prompted by a, an urgent situation. I mean, I didn't take a test or anything. They probably like, oh, Casey, you'll do it. So then they put me in the passenger seat and it's now he's in charge of patients. You know, so just move that way. How'd you move from ambulance work to police work? Um, so I had been, re so I was at uh, Hennepin for 18 years as a paramedic. So I came back from Spokane and, and that's in the epilogue. Um, so I came back and then I worked at Hennepin and I was in the training unit and um, part of the time, and, and so I trained other public safety workers. And then uh, I got recruited by Inver Hills Community College to go train paramedics down there. So I went down to Inver Hills and trained paramedics and worked part-time in Hennepin. However, I didn't have a master's degree. The pay was horrible. I had a wife and three kids. It was turned out to be a financial, really a big financial mistake for us. Uh, and then I thought, I'll go back to ambulance work. But I thought, if I'm going to be do back to shift work, Maybe that was my last chance to be a cop. So my brother John was a cop and he was having a fabulous career. So I thought, I'll go be a cop. So remarkably, at age 45, I became a St. Paul police officer. <laughs> <laughs> Which I wouldn't recommend it. I've had a fabulous career. I'm having a fabulous career. I'm not done. <laughs> um, so I, I mostly just thought, ah, I didn't want to be a police officer. I think I may have chosen ambulance work over police work, partly because um, I met my parents, try, I think, try to discourage John from being a police officer. And I kind of was very codependent and watched that and thought, oh, I'll do something next year. <laughs> so that, that, that answers it pretty well, yeah. So I'm grateful for that, go ahead. What do you think is the biggest change improvement um, to ambulance work since you began? That's a very interesting question. So ambulance work, uh, when I was getting into it, paramedics weren't even all, all over. And I explained in detail the difference between the paramedic and EMT. EMT is like, um, God bless them, but they're like advanced first aid people, where paramedics is like a profession where you create, you create airways for people, you, do, you, do, uh, you know, diagnose heart rhythms, you give medicines, that type of stuff. So there's actually a medicine practice. So I remember even the EMTs at Stillwater Ambulance used to mock paramedics, uh, they're just a, a, a passing fad, you know? Um, ambulance work was initially born out of uh, cardiac care. So, and then during the Vietnam War, um, Dave, tell me if I have this right, the Vietnam War kind of taught public, the public about trauma care. And so it evolved that way. Um, I haven't done ambulance work for 16 years, so I don't know. Um, it was a lot. It was a lot scrappier, and um, it, it's, less, it's much more precise occupation now. So yeah, profession. Profession, and actually, I should have referenced Diana. You should have answered that question. <laughs> so Diana was, I, I mentioned, was my paramedic instructor. And um, transition to a profession, that's a good way of saying it. I didn't do a very good job with that one. I was going to say, if you want to have anything to add, please. please if you have anything to add, please do. <laughs> I can use that. I know. <laughs> that's a good answer. You, you have to I just had a quick Stillwater story right. back to me from Lena. <laughs> um, I lived on 4th Street, and my friend lived on 3rd Street, and one night she was walking by and stopped in front of their house and yelled, you think you have the best legs. <laughs> so, and you needed to, if you were, you needed to be a local, and that was Lena. And you think you have the best legs? Oh, that's it's hilarious. Dark and, yeah, it's a story from Stillwater. That's a good one. Anything else, anybody? 
So um, I like to talk, I like to tell stories, I like public speaking. So if you have an opportunity for me to do that in other groups, I'd be glad to. If people you think might be interested in this book, um, buy it, or you can go online and look at it at amoslandbook.com. Yeah, if you guys are interested in buying it from us or through the other ways, we do have them at the front lobby and um, we'd be happy to help you with that. So.